The title of my sermon this morning is A Few Good Men. So let us open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1. And let's see what the Bible says. Now, today's topic is about being a man, becoming a man. But just because we're using this word men doesn't mean that if you're a woman, you can tune out, okay? It's every bit as important for you, and there's just as much uh, that you can learn and that applies to you as it does to men. So Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1, let's read it together. It says, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof, if you can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. So God here is saying, he's saying, go through Jerusalem and look for a man. See if you can find me a man. Okay, this is not, let me tell you what this is not like. This is not like a a woman telling her daughter, go to the supermarket and pick you up, Pick yourself up a nice young man. And the super, and the daughter goes to the supermarket and she looks and she says, I'm sorry, mom. They're all out of stock today. I'll have to go back tomorrow. This is not what that is like. Okay. You ladies, maybe have you ever wanted to cook something special and your, your local grocery store just doesn't have it and you have to go somewhere far. You have to go to that special store that has this ingredient for you to make that, that special, that special dish. For those of you who like technology, for some of you young people, you know, we, we buy, we like to buy things like cameras and all these cool little gadgets. And we go to Best Buy, right? When we want to buy something. But uh, sometimes Best Buy didn't have it. And what do you do when you, Best Buy doesn't have it? You go to Micro Center. Well, in California, we had a, a big, big store. It was even bigger than Micro Center. It was the size of Costco, okay? This huge store and they had full of electronics and you could find anything in there. And it was, it was amazing. And if you wanted to find something, you had to drive two hours, and I'm going to that store, and I'm going to buy this uh, special thing, and it was a great deal. Uh, but that is not what the Bible is talking about here. Let's read it again. It says, Run ye to and fro. Go here and there through the streets of Jerusalem and ask around. See what the, see if anybody, anybody knows in the places thereof, if you can find a man. God is saying there's such a shortage of men today that we cannot find one, one man that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. God is looking desperately for a man, and he cannot find one. Isn't that a sad commentary? So what does a man look like? How do you know when you find it? If you see a man, how do you know he's a man? What do you think of when you, when you, when you hear the word? His character, okay. But typically, that's a great answer, right? But typically in the world today, what do we think of when we, the word man, right? Muscles, okay, a cowboy, a Texan. Uh, You know, he's tall. Maybe he has a deep voice. Uh, He's got bulging muscles. You know, he he walks with a swagger, okay? He drives a great big truck, and as soon as he turns on that engine and gasses it, that truck rumbles, okay? This is a man, right? This is the... The picture that, that we have of, of a man. And you know, as, as young people, sometimes we think, okay, I have to have this or I have to be this, this way in order to be somebody, to be somebody of worth, to be somebody important. But that is not what God is talking about. The man that God is looking for, it says, a man that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth. This is something that transcends culture, personality, uh, your upbringing, poverty or wealth, your education, it has nothing to do with that. This is about your character. Now, there are some great men in the Bible, and we're going to look at them today, and we're going to see uh, some characteristics of these men. Now, the first man that we're going to talk about today is Samson. And let's go to Judges, chapter 13 and verse 5. Judges. Book of Judges, chapter 13 and verse 5. And we know who Samson was, right? Samson was a special man, and he was called by God. His parents called, uh, were, were selected by God for a special purpose, and that was to deliver Israel. 
Judges 13, verse 5. Uh, This is the angel talking to um, Samson's parents, and it says, For lo, thou shalt conceive, and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So this is Samson. He was called by God from the time of his birth to be a man for God. Now, we know what who Samson was. He was the strongest man on earth. There's never been a man stronger before him. There will never be a, a stronger man after him. He had muscle. This guy was big, okay? He carried off two huge gates on his back. They were probably as, as wide as this room, and he was carrying them on his shoulders. So he was a, he was a by worldly estimations, he was a man, right? He was, he was strong. He was this big guy. But I'm going to read a commentary on his life. From Conflict and Courage, uh, page 132. Conflict and Courage, page 132. And it says, God's promise that through Samson he would begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines was fulfilled. So Samson did his job in the end. He got it done, right? But how dark and terrible the record of that life, which might have been a praise to God and a glory to the nation. So you know what? He was this guy. He had this 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 talent from God, but you know what? It was so sad his life. So sad. Had Samson been true to the divine calling, the purpose of God could have been accomplished in his honor and exaltation, but he yielded to temptation and proved untrue to his trust. Uh, now listen to this. The next uh, paragraph, page 132, paragraph 3, it says physically Samson was the strongest man upon the earth, but in self-control, integrity, and firmness, he was one of the weakest men. One of the weakest men. Many mistake strong passions for a strong character. But the truth is that he who is mastered by his passions is a weak man. The real greatness of of the man is measured by the power of the feelings that he controls, not by those that control him. When you think of great men in the Bible, you think of men of position, men of power, kings, leaders, uh, people who have this big name, or maybe they have a big quality. In Samson's case, it was his strength. He had this, this great big quality. But guess what? But just because you're in a high position doesn't mean you are a great man in God's sight. Right. Mm-hmm. Samson, what does it say? He was the strongest man, but he had no self-control, no integrity and firmness. And in firmness, he was very, very weak. I'm going to read this again. The next sentence, it says, Many mistake strong passions for character. Passions are your, your emotions, your feelings, and how they come out of your, out, out of your life. Your, um, the outbursts of your, your insides. That, those are your passions. And if somebody is passionate about something, uh, that can be a good thing. But if you're mastered by your passions, it says you're a weak man. Now, Proverbs says, Proverbs 16, 32. Proverbs 16, 32, it says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So, are you slow to anger? Can you rule your spirit? You know, a lot of times people today... Can you, can you control your passions? People today, they, they say things like, oh, I just can't live without my Big Mac. <laughs> or, oh, I can't live without my, my meat. Or I gotta have my morning coffee. I, I, I just can't, I can't go without that. Are you really in control of your life? If you're, if you're dependent on this, on this thing, and you, and you tell yourself, oh, I can quit at any time. You know, it says, the real greatness of the man is measured by the power of the feelings that he controls, not the feelings that control him. We have another man in the Bible, another man who was also very great. He achieved high, uh, a high level of uh, prosperity and success. And this man was Solomon. This man was Solomon. Let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 3, and it says that Solomon loved the Lord. He was walking in the statutes of David his father, and he, but he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. 
That is a, that is a sad, uh, sad statement. But um, let's see. Let's continue reading a little bit. And in verse 5, in chapter 3, in verse 5, it says, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Can you imagine? How many of you would like to have the opportunity to ask God anything you want, and God will give it to you just like that? And Solomon, he had this opportunity. He was a special man, regardless of what he did. He was special. And, and he asked God in, uh, in verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself a Understanding to discern judgment, the next verse, verse 12, it says, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither shall any arise after thee. So Solomon was the wisest man on earth. Uh, there was no one wiser than Solomon. Let's go down uh, to the next chapter, if you're following along in your Bibles. In the next chapter of First Kings, chapter 4, uh, verse 29, First Kings 4.29, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Can you imagine? God gave Solomon such a big heart, such a big uh, heart that it was as big as the sand on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom, verse 30, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. In verse 31, for he was wiser than all men. And it goes on to list, he was wiser than Ethan and Heman and all, all of these men here in the rest of this verse in verse 31. And verse 32, it says, and he spake 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. So this guy, he was a record breaker, okay? This was a guy on the top of the Guinness Book of World Records. He was somebody. But... How long was he a man whom God could rely on? Let's go to verse 23. It, it talks even further. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 10. A few chapters down. 1 Kings chapter 10. And in verse 23 it says, So Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and wisdom. So now not only is he the wisest man that ever lived. He is the richest uh, man. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. And verse 26, And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen which he bestowed in the cities for chariots, and with the king at Jerusalem. I mean, this guy is breaking one record after another. I mean, just when you thought, Wow, he's done it all. What more could he possibly do? This guy breaks the next record. He's doing the next big thing. But we know the story. We know what happens to Solomon. He falls away from God. His passions control him. He loses his, his, uh, his sanity. And at the end of his life, he tries it all. He has done everything that you could possibly do. He's had all the fun that you could have. He's been everywhere. He has everything that you could own. Can you imagine, if you've ever wanted something, this man, this man, he had it. He owned it all. He was really living it up. And was he happy? Was he a great man? What does the Bible say in Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes. Let's go to chapter 1. Ecclesiastes. Uh, verse, verse 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. What profit 
hath a man of his labor which he taketh away under the sun. He's saying it's all worthless. It's absolutely worthless. You live, you die, you move on, and what did you leave? What do you have in this life left? Let's go to verse uh, 11 in the same chapter. Verse 11, it says, There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with, with those that are come after. He says, nobody's going to remember this stuff. This is, this is foolishness. This is, this is a waste. It's, it's all vanity. Vanity means something that is it's worthless. It, it's, it's shiny on the outside, but it doesn't have any value. It doesn't fill your soul. You know, It's glittering. It's... it's um, um, it's bling bling, as you've heard that term, but it doesn't have any real value. No. In verse 14, it says, I have seen all the works that are done in the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. I'm going to read a commentary again from Conflict and Courage, page 365. Conflict and Courage, page 365. It says, the Bible has little to say in praise of men. Little space is given to recounting the virtues of even the best men who have ever lived. This silence is not without a purpose. It is not without a lesson. And uh, further down in the paragraph, um, it says, it is a perilous thing to praise or exalt men. For if one comes to lose his sight of his entire dependence upon God and to trust to his own strength, he is sure to fall. You know, these are men, we just looked at two men whose lives, they were unbelievable. I mean, they had, they achieved great pinnacles of success in the worldly uh, understanding. And the Bible says they're worthless. They're absolutely worthless. If they're not uh, men of character, if they're not depending on God. So what does it take to be a great man? What is God looking for? We talked about two men. They were failures. They were failures. They started off right. They had some good times. It was short, but it didn't last. And their greatness got to, the, got to their head, and they lost it all. What is God looking for in a man? Is he looking for a, a great and noble birth? Do you have to be born to a certain family, to a certain house, to a certain culture, to a certain race, to a certain gender. What is God looking for? What does the Bible say um, about what we're looking for? You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16. But before we go there, or why are you looking for 1 Samuel 16? I'm going to read to you a quote uh, from Gospel Workers. Gospel Workers, page 92. And it says, in the ordinary walks of life, in the ordinary walks of life, there is many a man patiently treading the daily round of toil. Nothing special, just the regular routine. He's doing his job faithfully, all unconscious that he possesses powers, which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. Now, where did we find this guy? Where did we find him? In the ordinary walks of life. He's not doing anything special. He doesn't have a fancy job. He doesn't have a big name. But he, what, what is so special about him? It's that he is patiently treading the round of daily toil. He has self-discipline. He has self, he's a man of character. He is going to do the boring job if it needs to be done. You know, everybody likes to do the, uh, the fun job, the, the job that that's easy, that brings self-satisfaction, but nobody likes to step up and, and do that, maybe that dirty job that nobody wants to get their hands dirty. But this, this man that it's describing here, he's patiently treading the daily round of toil, and he possesses powers that would place him in equality with some of the great men of the earth, the kings, the leaders, the presidents um, in our world today. Now, I hope you've turned to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 4. Uh, let's see. Maybe not verse 4. Let's start in verse 1. Uh, we know that Saul was king of Israel, right? 
King Saul, he was the first king, and he was not doing well. Mm -hmm. And in verse 1, the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go. And I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king um, among his sons. So God is telling Samuel, he's saying, Look, Saul, he's over with. Forget him. We're going to find another king for Israel. And... In verse, let's see, 6, in verse 5, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5, uh, it says, in halfway through the verse, at the end of the verse, the last sentence, it says, And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And so Samuel, he went to their house, he was their guest, they had a meal together, and he's looking at the, the man Jesse, he's looking at his sons one by one, and in verse 6 it says, And they came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eliab. Can you imagine this man, Jesse? He has his sons lined up before, before Samuel. They're all at the table. And Samuel, he looks at the first, the oldest son, Eliab, and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. This has got to be the guy. He's tall. He's strong. He's great. He's a great fighter. He has experience, military experience. He knows what he's doing. This is a leader. This has got to be the guy. But what did God say? In verse 7, in verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not in his countenance, nor in the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth, not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Amen. So who is God looking for? What is God looking for in a man today? His what? His heart. A real man is measured by what's in his heart. Not by his body, not by his height, not by his wealth not by any other uh, physical uh, material that, or material thing that we, that we have. And let's go uh, and continue reading. And it says in verse 8, Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And verse 9, Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And he goes on, and he passes all of his sons before Samuel, and each time the Lord says, no, this is not the one. Mm -hmm. And Samuel, now he's beside himself. He can't imagine, well, if it's none of these, who's it going to be? Mm -hmm. These are the brightest, the best. This is like that family, you know, that special family, maybe in the church or in your, your job, that's those special people that they have a high position, they're, they're well known, and, and he's saying, it's none of these. Well, it's none of these, who's it going to be? And God said, Verse 11, Samuel said, are these all your children? Do you have anybody else? And, and Jesse said, look, you know what? I have one more, but he's the youngest. He's, he's nobody. Uh, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And the, the sheep, by the way, that, that was an immediate, uh, that's a, that's a way of saying he was mama's boy. Okay. He's keeping the sheep. <laughs> that, that, that was not a, a compliment. Okay. Um, to be to be keeping the sheep means you're you're a guy who, you know you're you're not very uh, physical. You don't do the the manly things. You're not out there with your dad doing these great things. This is kind of what's left for you to do. And but Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him. Verse eleven. For we will not come. We will not sit down till he come hither. Let's go to verse twelve. And it says he sent him and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and what. And withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly, goodly to look to. In other words, he he had you know fine skin. He was uh, he was a pretty boy. He wasn't this manly man, right? And what did the Lord say? Arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is the guy. This is the man. And we know the story. Samuel anointed him, and he became king of Israel. And what did God say about that king? What kind of man was he? He was a man after God's own heart. Now, how many of you would like to have that said about you? That you're a man or a woman after God's own heart. Some people think that they have to be a certain age to be great for God. You've got to wait until you grow up. Or maybe you're too old and you think, I've passed my time. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as that. How old was David when he was anointed? to be king of Israel. He was 17 years old. He was a young man. 
You don't have to be 17. You don't have to be a certain age. You can be young. You can be five. You can be 10. You can be old. You can be middle age. God has a place and a purpose for you. I'm going to read a paragraph from Christian Education, I believe, CE, uh, page 213. It says, The cause of God needs men who are sound in faith. They have tact and patience. They walk with God and abstain, abstain from the very appearance of evil. They stand so closely connected with God that they can be channels of, of light. In short, Christian gentlemen. Christian gentlemen. Another, another paragraph from Acts of the Apostles, page 507. Acts of the Apostles, page 507. It says, Sanctified, self-sacrificing men are needed. Men who will not shun trial and responsibility. Men who are brave and true. Men in whose hearts Christ has formed the hope of glory. And it says, For such for want of such workers, the cause of God languishes. The cause of God is languishing. All right, so we, we looked at what some of the things that God is looking for. Let's look at some characteristics, some very specific, definable characteristics that God is looking for in young men and young women and, and any age you are, men and women today. What are some of the things that God is looking for? <clears throat> Number one is full of integrity. Do you have integrity? And we're going to talk about what that means. Okay? Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. And in verse 1. Now, this is the story of David. He's running away from 1 Samuel chapter 24. In verse 1. David is running away from King Saul. Okay? He's being chased through the wilderness. And let's read verse 1 together. It says, uh, Saul gets news he, from his, his spies. He says, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Uh, and then verse 2, it says, And Saul took 3,000 men out of Israel, and he went to seek David upon the rocks of the wild goats. And um, in verse 3, it says, There was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David is, and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And verse 4, the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, and they, thou may doest to him as it may seem good to thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of, God, of Saul's robe privily. So what's happening here is David is with his best men in the cave. He went to go sneak up on Saul. And his men said, Look, this is it. This is the moment you've been waiting for all your life. You're destined to be king. You were anointed of God from the time you're young, and you have your chance, this is it, grab it, take it. He says, kill this man, he's evil, he's chasing you, he's been chasing you all his life, get rid of him and be done with it. And what did David do? He cut off a little piece of clothing, a little piece of cloth, and verse 5. What does it say in verse 5? And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. So he did this as a symbol, okay, of what he could have done and what he uh, had the ability to do, but he was so sorry. He was so hurt in his heart that he had done this terrible thing to Saul, the king of Israel, this evil man, and he was still so sorry because he had respect for his position. In the next verse, what does it say? In... Uh, Verse 6, it says, And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing until my master, the Lord's anointed. He says, It doesn't matter who he is or what he's done. He is the Lord's anointed. He is my master. And to stretch forth my hand against him, saying he is the anointed of the Lord. Can you imagine what integrity David had, that he was not willing to let his, his passions, his, his fear, his hate of, of this man get the better of him. And he said, You know what? It's the wrong thing to do. And if it's the wrong thing to do, I'm not going to do it. And praise God, he didn't do it. We have another example in the Bible of a man uh, who had a great quality. So that was David, he was full of integrity. Let's look at another one, true to duty. God is looking for men who are true to duty. They will not leave their post. They will not give up when the going gets tough, when the rainy days come. Let's look at 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 
2 Samuel 11, verse 6. Let's read it together. And it says, And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was coming to him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. The next verse, verse 8, it says, And David said unto Uriah, Go down to thy house, and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But what did Uriah do? Now the king gave him an order to go to his house, to take a break from the war, to rest up, to refresh himself. This is a direct order from his king. And what did he do? In verse 9, Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and he went not down unto his house. Why did he do that? Why did he sleep at the door of his house? What, what do you think? To protect the king. No, he he didn't want to. Uh, let's read in verse in verse ten. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down into his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down into thy house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark, Israel, and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab, in other words, the general, and the servants, my lord, are camped in the open fields. Then shall I go into my house, and eat, and drink, and lie with my wife, as thou livest, and as thy soul livest. I will not do this thing. What he is saying is that there is men out there fighting, fighting for this nation, and they are working hard, and they are doing everything that they can to win this war. How can I take a break? How can I for a moment sleep, slumber, uh, refresh myself when there are so many people, they're giving their everything, they're putting their life on the line. How on earth can I leave my post of duty? He was disobeying a direct order from the king. The king could have had him killed. He could have lost his life. Are you willing, if the time comes, are you willing to defy a direct order that can mean losing your life, your job, everything that you hold dear for the sake of honor, integrity, and being true to your post of duty? Are you willing to do that today? This is the kind of man that God is looking for. <clears throat> so that was the second the second characteristic, being true to duty, being true to duty. We have another characteristic of a great man or a woman that God is looking for, and that is not giving in to peer pressure, not giving in to peer pressure. We have an example in the Bible in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And in verse 26, Exodus chapter 2, uh, 32, verse 26, and it reads, Then Moses stood on the, in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And the sons of Levi gathered, gathered themselves together unto him. So in context, okay, what this is talking about, if you go a couple of verses earlier, let's go to verse uh, 19. Moses was going up into the mountain, Mount Sinai, to get the Ten Commandments to commune with God. And he had left the Israelites alone. In verse 19, what happened when he came back? And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand and break them beneath the mount. So while Moses was away, the entire camp... They lost it. They were going uh, crazy. They were being mischievous. And the entire camp, the whole group, were doing this terrible, this, this horrible, unthinkable thing. They were dancing in front of this calf. They, made it, they were worshiping a golden calf. They knew better. They had every reason to, uh, to not do that. And here they are doing this terrible thing. And Moses, he stands up and he says, Who is on the Lord's side? Who is going to stand up and do the right thing? Let him come unto me. It says, all the sons of Levi gathered together unto him. So there was a small group of people, the, the Levites, that 
said, you know what, I'm not afraid of those other guys who are dancing over there. Not, I'm not afraid of looking, uh, maybe not looking cool, okay? I'm not going to be the cool kid on the block anymore. Uh, I'm going to have to do what's right because it is right and because God expects it of me. And they went and they gathered themselves unto him. We have a commentary uh, in Prophets and Kings, page 142. And it says this, it says, God calls for men like Elijah, Nathan, and John the Baptist, men who will bear his message with faithfulness, regardless of the consequences, men who will speak the truth bravely, though it call for the sacrifice of all that they have. That, Prophets and Kings, page 142. So that is what God is looking for today. So that's another quality. We talked about um, f- integrity, being full of integrity. We talked about being true to duty. And this one was being uh, not giving in to peer pressure. When all of your friends, when everyone around you is doing something that's wrong, and you're going to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that, and you're going to stand up for what's right. And we have another quality here. Um, and that is not being afraid to speak the truth. Sometimes you've got to stand up and you've got to say something. And it may not be popular to say, say something. Let us um, read. I'm going to read from uh, Christian Service, page 177, talking about Nehemiah. It says, There is a need of Nehemiahs in the church today. Um and I'm going to skip, and I'm going to go to another another quotation from Conflict and Courage, uh, page 264. Conflict and Courage, page 264. It says, Nehemiah was a reformer, a great man raised up for an important time. As he came in contact with evil and every kind of opposition, fresh courage and zeal were aroused. His energy and determination inspired the people of Jerusalem, and strength and courage took the place of feebleness and discouragement. His high purpose, his, whole, his holy purpose, his high hope, his cheerful consecration to the work were contagious. The people caught the enthusiasm of their leader, and in his fear, each man became a Nehemiah and helped to make stronger the hand and heart of his, his neighbor. So again, what is the context of this of this reading. Nehemiah was a leader who came back from Babylon and he was leading in the rebuilding of the temple. And there was nobody, nobody who wanted to do it, nobody who wanted to stand up and help. They said, oh, it's impossible. It'll never get done. We don't have any um, tools. We don't have the ability. We can't defend ourselves. We don't have the money. We can't do this. We don't know what we're doing. And Nehemiah was saying, it doesn't matter. That's nonsense. He's saying, this is a job that needs to be done. And when it needs to be done, we're going to do it. And we're going to do whatever it takes uh, to get it done. Conflict and Courage, courage, page uh, page 264. (coughs) Conflict and Courage, page uh, 264. There is need of men um, like Ezra Nehemiah who will not palliate or excuse sin nor shrink from vindicating the honor of God. Nehemiah was a man when he saw... Uh, some some of his own church members in the city in Israel, they had, on the Sabbath day, they were selling wares in the city on the Sabbath day. And, um, you know, you know how it is with um, the the standards that God has. You, you know, they slide over the years. They slide over time. And they had gotten away from the whole people as a whole. And Nehemiah, he did not... Uh, excuse sin, he, without fear, he went to them and he said, what you're doing is wrong and this needs to stop. And he was not afraid to confront them for their wrongdoing. It's, uh, it says in the same page, in the same paragraph, uh, Conflict of Courage 269, it says, those upon whom rests the burden of their work will not hold their peace when wrong is done, neither when they, will they cover evil with a cloak of false charity. Now we have one more man that I would like to look at um, in the Bible today. And this man is interesting. Um, We looked at a couple of men this morning. We we, we talked about uh, Samson. We talked about um, King Solomon. And these are men who are obvious picks, obvious picks for some of the greatest men uh, in the Bible. 
because of their position, because of their uh, their achievements in life. Uh, but the Bible's the history, the Bible record shows that they are not the greatest. And we're going to look at Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter eleven. Matthew chapter eleven. And this is really the most unbelievable, the most surprising, the verse that talks about a man. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. Matthew 11, verse 11. And it says, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than than he. Now, who is that? John the Baptist. I mean, who is this guy? Like, what did he do? Right? Why is he so great? What, what does the verse say? He is the greatest that are born of women. I mean, apart from Jesus Christ, he is the greatest man in Bible record. Why? Why was he so great? He paved the way for Jesus. He did a lot of things. So we're going to look at one of his characteristics. He wasn't afraid to speak the truth. He was not afraid to say the right thing. Uh, in Matthew chapter 14, this is a few pages down in your Bible. Matthew chapter 14, verse 3, it says, uh, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. So we know the story. John the Baptist uh, was put in prison because he told the king that he was with committing adultery with his brother's wife. And he had no fear and he had no shame. And this was the king. And he was not afraid to tell him what he was doing is wrong and what, what he was doing was a sin. Would you, brothers and sisters, would you, my friends, today, would you have that courage to stand up to the king or the president or the leader or your boss and say, what you are doing is wrong, uh, what you're doing is a sin before God. Would you have that courage that, that John the Baptist had? Now, there's a great quote. Uh, it's in the Desire of Ages, and it's actually on the back of your uh, bulletin. So if you have your bulletin, you can look follow along. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to skip a couple of sentences down. It says, If intellectual greatness apart from any other higher consideration, is worthy of honor, then our homage is due to Satan, mm -hmm. whose intellectual power no man has ever equaled. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't measure greatness by how smart you are, by your IQ. Mm -hmm. This is from Desire of Ages, page 219. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, but when per perverted to self-serving, the greater the gift, the greater the curse it becomes. So this is what happened wow. in, the, in the lives of um, Solomon and the lives of Samson. <clears throat> it says, It is moral worth that God values. Love and purity are the attributes he prizes most. And it talks about uh, John the Baptist, and the last sentence it says, He's in selfish joy in the ministry of Christ presents the highest type of nobility um, ever revealed in man. So... What God is looking for is character, men of character, who will stand for him. Uh, the next paragraph, it says, uh, the witness born by John after his death, okay? After John died, those who heard him speak, they said this, and, and this is found in John 10, 41. It says, John, he did no miracle." But all things that John spake of this man were true. Everything he did, it was true. If someone were to evaluate your life, if they could make a statement about you, about you in one sentence, what would they say? Would they describe you as being true? John the Baptist was true. There's a great song, a uh, Christian song, and it's called A Few Good Men, and I'm going to read some of the, the words because they're, they're very uh, beautiful. It says, What this dying world could use is a willing man of God who dares to go against the grain and works without applause. 
a man who will raise the shield of faith, protecting what is pure, whose love is tough and gentle, a man whose word is sure. Continues, it says, God doesn't need an orator who knows just what to say. He doesn't need authorities to reason him away. He doesn't need an army to guarantee a win. He just needs a few good men. In verse 3 it says, He calls the broken derelict whose life has been renewed. He calls the one who has the strength to stand up for the truth. Enlistment lines are open and he wants you to come in. He just needs a few good men. So God is looking for these uh, men and women today. Father's Day, you know, it was just a few weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago exactly, uh, last uh, couple of Sundays. And, you know, as I look back at the life of my father the, and what, what he left me, you know, I realize I have some big shoes to fill, <laughs> some very, very big shoes to fill. And there are days when I, when I look at his life and I think about it and I think about where I am and I think, how am I ever going to get there? How am I ever going to be even as, as, as great as he was? But it's just enough just to, to walk in his steps and to, and to follow the path that he followed and to, and to have that, that model. You know, my, one of my, uh, my uncles, he said about my dad, he said, he said you know, your dad, he said, uh, he, was a, he was a great person, but he always had something funny about them. He, he always had an enemy or two. He always made some enemies. And I thought that was, that was funny. And I know it's true because my dad would come home from work. He would tell us about his day. He would tell us stories. And he said, you know, there's this one guy at work, and he doesn't like me. He doesn't, he doesn't like, uh, he's always trying to, you know, block me or... You know, that's a good thing. I would say that's a, that's a, that can be a good thing. Uh, not, not always, but in, in this case, I know it was. If your life, if you're living your life in such a way that you are, uh, you're getting on somebody's nerves, not because you're being obnoxious, but because you're standing for the truth and for what's right, mm-hmm. then you know what? Somebody will be bothered. Their conscience will be pricked mm-hmm. inside them and they will know and they will be, uh, annoyed by you and they will try to, Try to deter you. Don't be afraid to make enemies if you have to stand for what's right. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't don't be obnoxious out there. Okay. Don't we we don't uh, we don't want to be obnoxious. And th- this is a this is a, an important topic because today more and more things are happening in this world. More and more decisions are being made. You know, in, in society, things are changing. They're not the way they used to be. I mean, every week I hear something on the news and I'm surprised. I'm surprised at what happens, and and lots of things are happening, and you know not everything is right, and you you may have to stand up and say something. Now, there's a balance. There's a, there's a careful balance because you don't want to make an enemy of somebody um, as soon as you meet them, right? You you want to you want to stand for the truth, but you don't want to turn somebody off. Okay, you don't want to turn somebody off, uh, but you you have to find that. Um, that balance, and, and God, God can help you with that. Uh, God can help you with that. You know, the, um, there was once a, uh, in 1914, in 1914, uh, the United States entered into a war, World War I, and they put out this advertising campaign and they were looking for men to join the army. And they, they advertised this campaign with this, um, this famous poster. You've all seen it, right? It has Uncle Sam. He's got the Uncle Sam hat. He's got the Uncle Sam jacket. And he's pointing and he's saying, I want you for the U.S. Army. And it, it was so successful. It was so, uh, they printed four million copies. It, it was at that, t- at that time it was the most famous poster in the world that they reused it in World War II, and they said again, "I want you for the U.S. Army." And right now, God is standing like this, and He's asking each one of you, each one of us, men and women. And he says, "I want you to be my man and my woman today. Will you stand for me, and will you be this great uh, person and represent me today?" You know. There's so many things happening in this world, and people try to come up with solutions. They say, you know, this world is, is, is hurting, this world is crying, and we need to fix it. You know, we just had a terrible, terrible disaster shooting in Orlando, 
and uh, a lot of people lost their lives. And people will say, you know what we need in the world today is we need more love. We need more love. And that's true, and that's a good thing. And other people will say other things. They'll say what the world needs is equality for uh, you know, the rich not to prey upon the poor and that type of thing. And there are so many things that people will say that the world needs. But what the world really needs today, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who are in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. By God's grace, may each one of us be that young man, woman, or whatever age we are, wherever we are, be that man and woman for him. May God help us.